About to leave, already packing. Come with me, I'm not really asking. We'll get away to a place where we don't know. About to see the world in action. What we can be, life with no distractions. We'll get away, this is what we waited for. I've improved, 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 improved by a whole grade, by a whole grade, by a whole grade. My teacher isn't just Mr. Maddock, it's a whole teaching team made up of James, Mike, and Marta. My classroom's all about doing and applying. My day standing at the front of the classroom with a PowerPoint are long gone. I master every concept by learning at my own pace. I spend 100% of my class time interacting and supporting individual students. I move on only when the moment is right for me, not the whole class. I know what each and every student is mastering and struggling on at every moment. I know exactly what I need to learn next, and I can go back and review material at any time. I spend my teaching time supporting and inspiring, not planning, delivering and marking. I can learn from anywhere at any time. I can switch off when school closes, knowing they are learning from the best. My teacher has my homework marked before I get to class. I set every piece of homework at the start of the year. I'm two weeks ahead of my expected progress. I can track everyone's progress with a swipe of a finger. I can track my own progress and set my own targets. I now have time to focus on developing the skills of every learner in my classroom. I know exactly what it means to explain, evaluate and analyse, and I'm not afraid of any exam. My lessons are now far more about the skills and the application, not just the content itself. I've completely remodelled what it means to be a teacher in my classroom. Good afternoon. Uh, welcome to this revision session. It is Monday. I don't know what the date is, but it might be 21st of yes. May, something like that. Uh, and we're doing some skill acquisition and psychological factors in A-level P. So uh, I'm James. Thank you for being here. It's really appreciated. Uh, we have Marta with us as well today. Hello, good afternoon. She's controlling the uh, the feed. And we're going to get pretty much straight on with it because we've got a lot of content. A couple of reminders for you, please. Do please, just down there, subscribe to the YouTube channel. We ask it every time. Many of you have. Thank you. Those of, the, you, those of you that haven't, please do so. It makes a difference for us, so please do it. Um, secondly, we would like you to interact with the show. So two methodologies. Martin's going to show you them both now, I believe. Sure. The first way how you can do it is through our website, theeverlearner.com. All you need to go is click on News, go on to the... Hold on. There's a load more. We There's did a, a lot of blogging this weekend. <laughs> interactive questions. Yes, you may need to press on Show More. Interactive questions, and here are the questions. And today's is on memory information processing. And reaction. And reaction. That's so right. click on here. And here is your question for today. Don't forget to submit when you're finished. Okay, great. So that's really important. And I mean, the the question on there is an evaluate question. It's an interesting one. It may have different mark levels for different exam papers. Um, but it's an interesting question, that one, to actually evaluate something like the multistore memory model. And it's a good one for developing skill. We'll have a look at that uh, question and an answer in a few moments' time. Now, we'd also like you to interact with us during the show as well by sending us some photos of things that you are doing uh, in your revision break. So do send those in to us, please. We want to see, uh, can, yeah, whatever it is you're doing, really. I guess, uh, whether it be kind of something work-based or something more recreational, we'd like to see those, please. So we always share appropriate ones in the stream. So send those in to us and we'll get those uh, We'll get those on and get a bit of a shout out. And anyone who sends in a nice photo, we always reward you with a bit of a roadmap student pack as well. So uh, do get involved for that reason. It's, it's kind of a useful thing. 
Um, okay, now, uh, finally from me, a um, couple of things. First of all, be reminded that your uh, volume levels may change during the show as we switch between different microphones. I'm going to shove this one away in a second uh, as, we sh as, as we do that, so uh, be aware uh, of that. And you need to have the notes pages in front of you. If you're taking this show live with us right this second, well, that depends on what the second is, I suppose, but you know what I mean. Um, if you're taking it live, the notes pages have probably been given to you already by your teacher. If you haven't, they're just down there. You can kind of scramble and get them ready. They're just in the description to the uh, live stream itself, and you can you can grab those now. And obviously, if you're on demand, you you can get the the notes out of the description to the video, so that will work fine for you. Uh, all those things being said, Martin, we have a lot of content, so I'm wary that we, if we're not careful, we'll go over time. So I suggest we get straight on with it if you're ready. Mm -hmm, I'm ready. Yeah. Okay. Let's do that then. Okay, good stuff. Let's make a real good start on this. So we're going to look at memory. Specifically, we are going to have a look at the multi-store memory model. So make sure you understand that. For those of you that uh, study badly in Hitch, for example, or those of you who studied other memory models, we are specifically looking at the multi-store memory model here. So just make sure you have that clear in your mind. Um, I also want to address with you that you I mean, it's an obvious point to make, really, but this topic is very, very, very closely linked, closely linked to information processing. So, again, for your exam board specific requirements, you do want to be thinking about this topic as a combination effect with regard to your information processing model. Now, some of you look at Craig and Lockhart, some of you look at Whiting, some of you look at Welford, some of you look at all three. You need to be considering those kind of possibilities with regard to this this area as well. And before we get sort of deep into the model on the multi-store memory model, I want to remind you of something, and that is the notion of the display. Okay, so I'd like you just to make note of this, please, the display. And I, if I put that word in front of you, I would automatically ask you, what does it say to you? Does it say anything? Now, when we talk about the display with regard to uh, memory, and again, in information processing, even to an extent, you know, reaction time, which we're going to look at in this live show, um, we're, we're talking about the notion of all the information surrounding an individual who in our context, of course, is taking part in some kind of sporting performance. And that all information is a combination of intrinsic information, you know, the feeling that the individual experiences, the sense of equilibrium, the kinesthesis, the proprioception, these sorts of notions. And it's all of the extrinsic information. But please focus on the word all. It sounds, it's... Um, it, it's it's visual, it's movement, it's kinesthetic, it's all of these things combined make up the breadth of the display. And I mention the word breadth because, of course, that, that makes the display an incredibly broad concept, an incredibly wide array of information. The other point we'd make, and again, you can link this back to recent things we've done on these live shows with regard to associationist um, behaviorist theories such as operant conditioning, it's what we call stimuli-based. Okay, so the information that surrounds a performer, or indeed comes from within the performer, is based on the concept of stimulus, or a stimulus, or a number of stimuli. So we call it a stimuli-based environment. And finally, as I said before, this is a vast quantity of data. Okay, so wherever you are in the world right now, you may want to just sort of start to sort of internalize and perceive in a little bit more clarity the things that are around you. Notice the, t the, the different color tones. Notice uh, the different shapes and forms of objects around you. Notice things that are moving and things that are still. Tune your ear into the, to the hum of your device or the silence or my voice or whatever. And you'll start to realize there's a huge amount of data that goes on around us that perhaps sometimes we're not always completely kind of conscious of more of which in a second so that's one thing i wanted to clarify with you i haven't really left myself any space i didn't plan this very well but the second point i want to make for you is the idea of the memory store okay so find some um space on your notes please when we talk about the memory store we are talking about three areas we're talking about the stss the short-term central store we're going to look at that in detail in a second we're talking about the short-term memory the stm and we're talking about the ltm the long-term memory we're going to look at these in uh detail and as i said before this is a notion of a multi-store memory model okay multi-store memory model and the reason i'm just repeating that 
is that we are going to, in many ways, isolate each of these in a moment, but really, and, and describe them, but really what we want to be able to do is to be able to understand them in combination and how they function. Now, finally, I also want to introduce you today or remind you potentially of three processes. I'm actually not sure I'm going to write this because, hey, let me put it in here. The three processes, okay? Three processes I want you to really get a grip of today. The first one is what we call encoding. And you'll see it on the image, it's already on there, but we're talking about encoding. And by encoding, we're, we're talking about putting it in. Putting it in. And what we mean by that is how we actually take the information from the display and we actually place it into our memory, in, including potentially in our long-term memory. We also want to think about the notion of maintenance. Now, you can think about this, of course, as practice and usage but we're talking here about keeping it alive, keeping it alive. And what we mean by that is if we've stored a really great schema or movement pattern, a motor program about a particular movement, then of course this maintenance is important because we have to use it to keep it alive. We also have to practice it, more of which a bit later on, to make sure it's as sharp as possible. And finally, we have to think about the notion of retrieval. Okay, retrieval. Retrieval is what we call finding it. So something which is stored in your memory, we have to retrieve it. And by the way, we can also call this decoding. So we're interested in those three processes with regard to these three stores. Now, all that's introductory bump. Let's actually have a look at this. Now, the model itself, this is our version of it. You will see slightly different versions with slightly different arrows that is normal. The things that we would like to point out to you here is that, of course, what we've got over here somewhere is effectively the display. Okay, so we've effectively got the display over here. And in the image, the display is simply represented by a bunch of arrows, and there's many of them. Why? Because of what we said a moment ago, the display is very, very varied. This theory argues that all the information from the display enters your short-term sensory store. Fine, let's talk about the short-term sensory store. What is it? Well, of course, because it's from the display, it comes from our senses, that our senses, such as our vision, our hearing, um, our proprioception, these senses pick up information from the display. We're also saying that the short-term sensory store is also sense-specific. Let me be clear what we mean by that. We are arguing, or at least this theory is arguing, that we have a visual short-term sensory store. Now, I know those of you that do the Badley and Hitch model, I know you're going to talk about visual spatial sketch, but just for now, we're not going down that route, okay? But we are saying the short-term sensory store has sense-specific um, uh, stores, and they are going to be auditory, they're going to be visual, they're going to be kinesthetic, they're going to be sense-specific. So it may well be that we have multiple of these, at least conceptually. As I said a moment ago, it is all the information, all the information from display is stored in the short-term sensory store. So think about the capacity required to do that. It's a vast capacity that's necessary. And because of that, we describe this as an unlimited capacity an unlimited capacity. So we are saying your short-term sensory store in you, that you are capable of internalizing, albeit subconsciously, more of which in a second, all of the information that surrounds you, even if you're not consciously aware of it. Now that is an interesting thing to say. It's also because of the because of the huge amount of information, it's also a very temporary store. And we're saying, by the way, different texts say different things about this, but I'm going to give you the argument that it's a half a second store. Now, just be aware that sometimes your book might say one second. Just want to, you might just want to check on your in your textbook and say, does it say one or a half? But it's a very, very temporary store. And finally, as I've touched on already, this store is what we'd call subconscious. What we mean by that is we do not have conscious awareness necessarily of the information that we are internalizing. So I mentioned before the specific, to let's say you're um, playing some um, invasion game, you're playing netball or you're playing hockey or football or something out on sort of a field or a court, you may not consciously notice the specific tone of blue or gray or whatever the color of the sky is above you but that information is entering your short-term sensory store. And because some of it is irrelevant, in fact, probably the majority of it is irrelevant, we, of course, want to use that golden term, which is selective attention. 
only some of this information is going to enter into a conscious frame of actually processing this data only some of it so we obviously within that model we're going to have the notion of selective attention we can actually see it over here of course now what do we then do with our second store well we're saying that from these sense specific short-term sensory stores we are encoding remind yourself what encoding means actually i don't want that line there remind yourself what encoding means putting it in okay we are encoding that information and placing it into the short-term memory. Now, a couple of things about short-term memory. We often call it the working memory. Yes, I know some of you study this in more detail, but we often call this the working memory. Make sure you can use that term. But we want to describe the short-term sensory store in, in, uh, in the following way. It's actually the information perceived. So in other words, it's that which becomes sort of consciously, uh, we become consciously aware of it. And I might become, it goes from being subconscious to being conscious. It involves information that is being judged. So we're judging information that enters our short term memory. We are also, let me change color, we're also comparing information. Now, of course, that should immediately get you to think about what we call the DCR process which we tend to think about in relation to information processing, but DCR processes, of course, detection, comparison, recognition. And of course, the um, if we take uh, numerous information processing models, but if we take some like Whiting's model specifically, we would argue that that DCR process is happening in consultation with the short-term memory, communicating with the long-term memory, okay? So we're comparing information in that sense. The short-term memory also initiates movement. Okay, so again, it is the executive, the controlling aspect of our memory. It also retrieves info. Retrieves info. Well, where would it retrieve info information from? And of course, this is where we've got this notion of decoding information back from the long-term memory. Why? Because we have to compare it to what's in our present exposure to our display. Okay, so it's retrieving information from the long-term memory. And we also know and that's of course a decoding process. We also know that short-term memory encodes information. Look here, the short-term memory is encoding information and placing into the long-term memory, more of which in a second. Now, with the short-term memory, we have a limited capacity, okay? And it's believed to be able to process something like five to nine pieces at any one time, but it does depend on how those pieces of information are organized. And finally, the short-term memory is thought to be something like a 30-second store. And you probably experience this day-to-day -day that, you know, in a particular moment, you'll think about something, you'll be processing a thought, and you'll forget it a few seconds later. It's thought to be around about 30 seconds, something like that. So that's how we describe the short-term memory, okay? So if we were asked to describe it, this is the information that we would include. Now, finally, finally, I want to talk to you about the long-term memory. Now, first of all, we're talking about a, a, a storage space. So, of course, we need to think about what is stored. So EMPs are stored there. Remind yourself that EMPs are executive motor programs, so the whole pattern of a movement skill. We can, of course, follow the schema theory model. So schemas are stored there. A schema is like a schematic or a plan for a movement. And the main difference between um, EMP theory and schema theory is schema kind of recognizes the importance of the schema being open and broad. And what we mean by that is that it can be, you know, something like a throwing schema can be used in many, many different formats. So that's something we want to be thinking about. Now, we're also, of course, talking about info decoding. We already know that for the short-term memory to do its comparison work, it needs information from the long-term memory coming back to be processed. So we decode information from the long-term memory. And as I said just now, it's sent back to the short-term memory for comparison, okay, and decision-making. Now, this is an interesting point. The argument here is that the, the, uh, the long-term memory is permanent. Reflect on that a moment. Is it? and that the long-term memory is unlimited. So you should never need something like, uh, you should never need like a, 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 a storage increase. You should never need to upgrade your storage. There should be enough storage in that long-term memory to store anything and any quantity for any period of time. That's an interesting concept. Not everyone likes to accept that principle and I'll allow you to reflect on whether you think that is or isn't true.
Now, a couple of other things I want to get through, and I don't know where I'm going to put this because I haven't really left my seven space. I'm actually going to put it over here. Okay, so I want to talk about strengths of this theory. Strengths. So a couple of things that we like about this theory is it has the STM as working memory. That seems to make sense that the short-term memory is kind of where all the decisions are made in the comparison. We also like in this theory that it has the STSS is sense specific that helps to understand the model so that we we can look at the specific nature of um, different type of sensory information coming into the system and we can also say that this model fits well with what we might call traditional information processing model so let's say it fits well with Whiting's model if you don't know what I'm talking about with Whiting's model just have a little look through your notes and you should have some information on that another strength or the final strength is it really emphasizes the need for maintenance. Emphasizes need for maintenance. And what we mean by that is that the model clearly shows the encoding decoding process. So unless we're using our uh, memories in the long-term memory, our stored memories, we can make an argument that they're gonna become sort of less and less sharp. Now on the weaknesses side, we have a few things here. First of all, um, we can describe the model as overly simplistic. Okay, so you might not agree with that at this particular moment, but it is a simple model. It does simplify this, um, these ideas. It's been heavily criticized for a lack of evidence. I mean, some theorists would argue that there's no evidence for this model whatsoever. That's an interesting one, but we maintain it in our courses. Um, we also have the long-term memory. Often, if we just think about our experience with people, often not permanent. Okay, so people do seem to forget things that have been stored in the long-term memory. I'm not talking about some kind of like old age kind of dementia type situation here. I'm talking about something that's just not used and we do seem to forget. Now other people uh, say with movement skills, for example, it's that old classic notion of you never you never forget how to ride a bike or you know, you always remember, how does, how does that saying go? You never forget how to ride a bike or I can't remember exactly how it's worded, but it's this same, um, the, the strength of it would be that's the point, but we're saying here weakness is, well, maybe some people do forget. And final weakness is that it offers no explanation. It offers no explanation um, of the translatory mechanism. Okay, and what we mean by that is how is how does this encoding, decoding actually happen? What is the process that was meant to be there? What is the process of that actually happening? We're saying that this theory basically doesn't address that. It just states it. Okay, let's have a little look at a question here. We've got evaluate, let me choose red. We've got evaluate. We know that by evaluation, we need to be uh, um, looking at both sides of a, of a concept and, and reaching a judgment or a conclusion. But we're gonna evaluate the multi memory model as a method of explaining how motor skills are stored, retrieved, and refined. So we really should be talking there about storage, of course, that's the encoding of retrieval, the decoding, and the refinement, the maintenance. So that has got to feature in my answer. Now, again, like always with these, I've prepared the answer. You may want to, if you're on the, we can do this on the live stream as well with the DVI. You can pause and check as I go through this. If you're watching this on demand, take your time as this answer goes in. Let's go for it. Look, so straight away into the evaluative mentality. A strength of the model. I'm clearly evaluating. I can't, I, I could just describe the thing, but there's no point. I need to evaluate it. A strength of the model is that it recognizes the STM as the working memory, okay? However, comma, so I'm on now on the other side, the model in general is far too simplistic to effectively explain the complexities of memory. Okay, dum dum. If this is a one mark, if this is a circle tick one mark uh, structure, so we've got to get eight points here. If it happens to be a circle tick one mark, we'd get two marks for those points, one positive, one negative. Okay, if it's a level question, we'd be in a different situation. You guys know that already. Second bunch of points. On the one hand, comma, so I'm saying here, on the one hand, looking from the positive, looking from this side, on the one hand, the model identifies that the STSS could be sense specific. So that seems like an advantage. That seems like a positive. On the other hand, now view in the other side, there is a lack of evidence to support this position. Okay, so it seems like a nice idea. Where's the evidence? The for and the against. An advantage of the model, so again, I'm in that frame, 
where am I? The advantage of the model is that it simplifies the ideas of encoding and decoding between the stores. Okay, so it simplifies this idea of encoding and decoding and allows people to understand it. A disadvantage is, is that the model offers no expectation of how this translatory mechanism operates. So it offers it, but doesn't explain it. Interesting. So we're now making good progress. Two more little sections. Her strength, all I'm doing is evaluating. Her strength is that the long-term memory is offered as the location of permanently stored movement patterns in the form of um, EMPs or schemas. However, comma the negative, there is evidence that the long-term memory is not permanent and skills can be lost or forgotten if they are not maintained. Okay, so we've clearly gone through an evaluative process. Now, it's my perspective that we should always reach a conclusion if we're evaluating. If you think that you are judging something from both sides, it, it's common sense to reach some kind of balanced conclusion at the end of that process. So here's my conclusion, just real simple thing. In conclusion, the multi-store memory model is an excellent introductory theory to understand the complexities of memory, but other models clearly need to be considered. So it's not going to really get me any marks. If I was in a level question, I would be sort of meeting the requirements of the question here by giving a conclusion. I'm just summarizing the ideas and the balance of the uh, reasons that I've put across in my answer. Okay, so I think that's really, really important for us. So look, evaluation, uh, judge from both sides and reach conclusion, working memory model. There we go. Any questions? Yes. Right. First of all, James, I'd like to ask you, what is the difference between remembering a piece of information and remembering a movement? No difference. Any? Okay. So um, the only points I would make there is if you if you've learned something new as kind of a thought or a concept or, or an idea, it may it may seem to you much faster or easier than learning something like a sporting technique, for example. But the reason that would be is that the sporting technique contains an awful lot of information. So if you were to compare something like remembering that two add two equals four to something like a bowling technique or a, even a throwing technique or something like that, you've got an awful lot more information in this physical movement which is stored as either a schematic in the long-term memory or as a program in the long-term memory, either a motor program or a schema. So for that reason, you'd have to look at comparative information. So a very, very complex concept combined uh, would be comparable to something like a whole movement pattern. But in terms of how they're stored, I mean, they're effectively stored in the same way. I, I think you probably could make an argument that uh, the translation 
of movements is more complex because obviously you've got to you've got to translate them as stored schemas or memories uh, and reproduce them as movement patterns rather than reproduce them say as language or as writing which might be a more direct route mm -hmm. okay and is there any evidence to suggest that you can improve your memory and if Ooh. so do any models take this into account okay so improving memory that that that, that is a kind of a whole extra topic for us so there's numerous models that are proven to work in in that um in that sphere in that area so i'll give you a couple of um couple of examples one is chaining so you chain you chain sequentially coaching points onto each other or you even use something like a progressive part uh, methodology you might use chunking which is you actually link items together we do it a lot with things like phone numbers it work if you think about the word I'm, i've got a book here for example if you think about the word book you don't store it as a b an o an o and a k you you store it as a as a book as the concept as the word as a book and you would you, you chunk those elements together it's the same with movement patterns if you've got the if you think about the kicking technique in a sport which involves kicking a ball say um then you may well ha actually store that information about that kicking action chunked together as one single piece of information okay so those um that works really really well um we've also got the idea of association so it comes back to our kind of behaviorist models uh, we associate something like uh, new learning with old learning which helps a lot with things like proactive transfer positive transfer these sorts of processes work really really well but the key thing i would say uh, with regard to improving memory is making practice of whatever you're doing purposeful so what we would mean by that is making practice high quality at the right challenge level for the individual that will improve their memory storage of the learning that's come that, that's been taking place because it's relevant to them as the individual rather than just sort of a general batch of information which is which is sort of homogenous and generic to more people there's okay. there's more on that list in terms of improved memory if you want the full list of that you need to go to the everlearn.com on mypexam.org and actually have a look at that entire tutorial on improved memory i actually thought about improve uh in um, including it today but only some of the students on some of the exam boards actually studied that chunk to use that term mm -hmm. okay any others no that's it for now all right cool so we've got a lot of content left so uh we're going to switch on to reaction time here as including some anticipation and prp as well now there is one exam board this is not relevant for at least it won't appear on your exam that's not to say it would be useless to you but it doesn't appear on your, on your exam, you OCR students, so just be aware of that, okay? We, I, I'll, I'll mention it again. Okay, ready? Mm -hmm. Good. Okay, let's have a look at the concepts of reaction time. And guys, I'm so sorry if you are an OCR student, this is kind of peripheral knowledge for you. So uh, you may just wanna make a call about whether you study this or not. Um, it's not directly featured in your um, specification, so you know, you may want to choose not to in that case. You're very welcome to stay and to take part. Of course you are. Um, so let's look at our key terms here. Response time, first of all. I want us to understand that response time, as we see here, is reaction time plus movement time. So let's come back to this definition and let's define the other two. That should actually give us the definition of what response time is. So reaction time is what we call, what is what we have is the onset to the start of the movement. So if we were sort of wording this out, we'd say uh, reaction time uh, is the time between the onset of the stimulus and the start of reaction in response to the stimulus. So it's the time between the onset of the information, let's say the b of the bang of the gun in athletics, say, and the first press off the blocks. Okay, so that would be the reaction time. Movement time, however, is the time between the start of the movement and the completion of the movement. So it actually comes after this point, okay? So the movement time is the time taken between the start of the movement in response and the completion of that movement. So some people think, well, that's running the whole 100 meters. But what we mean here is this could be, we might define this as how long it takes for the, for the feet to actually leave the blocks in athletics, for example. Not necessarily the whole race, but how long do we, does it take to actually get our feet out of the blocks? So, of course, if we've got response time as both of these, what must it therefore be? Well, it's got to be the time between the onset of the stimulus and the completion of the movement. So, 
The response time in athletics, let's say sprinting for argument's sake, is the time between the B of the bang and the, and the clock starting and the feet leaving the blocks, if that's how we define that concept, okay? So we just need to be able to differentiate those points, and it's useful in order to be able to do that. Now, one thing you might find interesting is if we just take reaction time for a second, if we look at the notion of, that's not going to come through, bro, if we take the notion of elite athletes, that reaction time, remember, just to initiate the movement, takes something between, generally speaking, it takes something between 0 0.1 seconds to 0 0.2 seconds. So this is a very, very quick process. Okay, so we need to understand that. And finally, I want you guys to understand that there's two types of reaction. Okay, so we have two types of reaction. The first one is what we call simple, simple reactions. Okay, and we define a simple reaction by the notion that there is only one possibility or one possible response. Let's put it that way, that one possible response. So that's what we call a simple reaction time. So think about our sprinting example. There goes the bang of the gun. What are my choices here? Run. Okay, so I've got one possible response in that situation. But we also have, of course, a different notion of reaction. We also have what we call choice reaction choice reactions. These are really nice terms for you to internalize. This is where we have multiple, multiple possible responses. So of course we can't look at, I know you could say to me, well, you know, the sprinter could choose not to run, but okay, we're looking at sporting responses. So let's say a, let's take a badminton. Let's just choose a racket sport. Let's choose badminton. You can put it in the context of tennis, whatever you like. In this model perhaps the perhaps the badminton player is uh, is served up i don't mean with a serve, is presented with a high mid court uh shuttlecock so really the typical response to that is to kill it is to smash okay but they could for example if the opponent is expecting a smash and, and they've got very quick reactions for example they may well use that to further position out of out of um to further put the opponent out of position and push them to the back corner, for example, or to drop it in low. Now, so as a result of that, the performer has multiple choices of what they could do in that situation. Maybe one is more likely, I'd normally smash here, I'd normally kill the point, but actually, maybe in the last three points, I've gone to smash a number of times and the shuttle's cock's been blocked back and I've ended up losing the point. So therefore, they've got choices within that environment to choose different options, and that's what we call a choice reaction. Now, Hick, bless him, went on to explain this in some detail. And Hick um, produced what I often refer to, and I encourage you to think about, as a bottleneck theory. A bottleneck theory. What, James, what are you talking about? So the idea of Hick's law basically sh says to us that as the number of possible responses or the number of possible solutions in, in a situation increases, the response time, remember reaction time plus movement time, the response time increases until it kind of plateaus it gets to a sort of a um a saturation point okay so we see here if we take this point here just for argument's sake okay let's call that one option so there's one possible choice there notice that both this performer and this performer their response time is what we might loosely call fast Okay, if we get to here, for example, let's just use a very base idea. I mean, you've got to realize there's many. Let's just call this 10 options. There's 10 options at this point. Okay, now we track that up. Well, this performer is now react is responding at that speed, and this performer is responding at that speed. So obviously, in our choice reaction situation, it takes significantly longer, according to Hick, to actually respond through our movement, uh, through our response time responses. That's not a very well put statement. The other thing we can say here is that this bottom curve represents what we call an expert. And of course, if we talk about someone as an expert, expert, we can call them an autonomous, an autonomous stage learner. You know, those guys, they're going to react much faster total than someone who is untrained. So of course, up here, we have what we would call a novice, or we can, of course, call it a cognitive stage learner. They take much longer to respond but the key point i want to get to you is that once we kind of reach this saturation point the rest of the curve goes up very slowly so let's call this a hundred or a million different possible choices basically 
it's only slightly shorter than the 10 possible options, okay? Oh, sorry, it only takes slightly longer, I should say. So that's why we call it a bottleneck theory, because once the choices in choice reaction are, are very multiple, it effectively means that you're not gonna react any more slowly, although we still get a sort of a gradual increase. Basically, the big losses are from having more than one option, single choice, uh, single reactions, to choice reactions, multiple options. So that's where kind of, we've got the idea there that um, choice reaction needs to be practiced in that environment, right? We need to get used to that skill. Um, and of course, we can see the decision-making time or the reaction time, the information pro the time for the information processing, what we call reaction time. It takes much longer for people who are unpracticed or untrained. So Hick gives us a really good insight into that concept. Let's move on. Now, I also want to talk to you about how we could sort of visualize uh, simple and choice reaction. Remember, we've got this concept up here, simple reactions and choice reactions. How could we actually visualize that? Well, here, for example, we've got this notion that we could, we could put it into this sort of context. Maybe what we've got here, this is what we would call a simple reaction. Okay, a simple reaction. Okay, simple reaction. This is example A. Look, the idea is that, that look, here, this, this point here, this is the decision, this point here. Let's just put a little line across. Okay, and we notice, look, that if there's only one possible alternative, that process happens much faster, okay? But on example B over here, what we have is choice reaction. Okay, choice reaction. By the way, we made these images, I'm really happy with them. Uh, but with choice reaction, of course, what we've got here is that all of these are possible alternative solutions to the problem. Let's argue that this one is the correct one. Okay. It takes longer for that to be to come down to the decision to be made and for the decision to, to be turned, translated into a movement response. And that starts to emphasize why choice reactions take longer. It starts to reassure us that Hick wasn't crazy and that that makes perfect intuitive common sense. So it's a nice way to visualize it. Now, one way we can shorten response times is we can use a model of anticipation. So let's make sure we understand what anticipation is. We're aiming to reduce reaction time or we are aiming to increase the speed of information processing. <gasps> Take a breath, James. So we've got two ways. We've got what we call spatial anticipation. And the way we like to think about this is it's what we call preloading a skill. Okay, now I don't know why. I, I always think about rounders or baseball or softball in this situation or even a cricketer. And it's the idea of, right, that the bowl is about to bowl to me. I'm going to open my body and I'm going to play an open hand, right-handed shot over first base head or through the offside in cricket or something like that. You preload the skill. And what that means is that your alternative is being selected and makes it basically only one possible alternative. The problem with that, of course, is it might not be the right skill, but we call that spatial anticipation. And you might realize that you do it more than you think you do. We do that a lot in sport. And the second one is what we call temporal or time-based anticipation. And with temporal anticipation, it's what we call a prediction of the situation. Okay, so this could be, you know, you're playing in tennis, for example, and um, your opponent has got a mid-court shot, which puts them in a very attacking position. You have to predict, you have to um you know, in order to be able to get the ball back either on the backhand or the forehand side, you're going to have to make a prediction and you notice your opponent opens their stance up and it appears they're going to hit an open forehand. So therefore you go to, if you're a right-hander, your backhand side. Okay, you predict the situation. Now, of course, you find many of the times that the uh, opponent has made a fake, more of which in a second, and then whips the ball across to the other side. So we can predict the situation in order to get there faster. And it's called temporal anticipation it doesn't work every single time but it can be useful in a situation where either someone's very very good at picking up the cues of the opponent like the the, the what do you call the tells of the opponent um or indeed if someone's in a defensive position and they're, and they're forced to make a decision and remember that spatial is pre-loading skill now let's move on let's have a look at what we call the prp and um of course with prp prp 
therapy, we want to remind ourselves that this is what we call a psychological, psychological refractory period. And I have to say, there's never been a single occurrence in my teaching career that I've explained this and been happy with my explanation. So I'm kind of dreading this in some ways, but it's actually a super simple concept, but it's something that maybe we can get confused about. The applications are as follows. We're interested in how this helps us to understand the notion of throwing a dummy. Let me put that in inverted commas, actually. Throwing a dummy, okay? So it helps us understand why that um, works for us. It's how performers present fake information, which that wording's taken on new context in the world of fake news or the concept of fake news in recent years. But it's how a performer will present fake information to their opponent. And they're trying to create what we call a delayed response in their opponent. I will contextualize this for you in a second, okay? And it's what we call the single channel hypothesis. Okay, and the single channel hypothesis basically says that a performer must complete their reaction to a stimulus before they start a second reaction to that stimulus. Okay, so let's have a look at how this works. What sport should we choose? Let's choose, um, what am I rubbish at? I'm rubbish at rugby, so let me choose rugby, okay? So the idea here is, um, let, let's, ima let's imagine, let me do a dodgy old drawing. Let's imagine we've got player A over here and player A has got the rugby ball. Look what a beautiful drawing that is. And they're running towards player B with that rugby ball. And player B, of course, wants to tackle player A. They want to they wanna, you know, effectively take possession of the ball away from them, okay? So how would this work in this environment with this beautifully drawn illustration? Well, first of all, let's just look at the structure of our illustration. Notice that time is passing to the right. Okay, we measure time in milliseconds. So realize immediately, this is a super short period of time. We are not talking about excessive periods. We're not talking about seconds or minutes here. We're talking about quick, rapid changes, okay? So let's say that our player, what did we say? It was player, uh, player A, our player A, here's player A. Let's say that they start making this move and they seem to be making a dodging move to their right. So they step off their left foot in that direction, okay? That would be what we call stimulus one. Now you probably realize that the reaction by player B is very likely therefore to make that move, right? That's what we call reaction one, reaction one. They go to defend that run. Now, player A suddenly takes a hard step off their right foot and now darts to the left. Well, PRP theory tells us that player B, they have to complete this reaction. Okay, here's the completion of the reaction, this point here, before they can go and tackle player B with a second reaction. So look, here's the first move there that's stimulus one. If I was to track it down, look, there's stimulus one. Here's the dart to the left. That's stimulus two. Okay. Now reaction one, which is player B's reaction to, fur to the first stimulus, doesn't end until this point here. So they can't divert back and defend the second run until this point here. So the new information is presented at this point. They start their reaction at this point, And as a result, they have this whole period of time where they're actually still completing reaction one, which is the wrong reaction, at least for what's gonna happen in the end. Meanwhile, the player's gone and round the corner and they run in and score a try or they run in and pass off their shoulder or whatever. It might just be that they get enough distance that they can they, they still get tackled by this player, but they can pass out of the tackle and, and therefore one of their teammates can go and score. Okay, So this produces this psychological refractory period, which is a period of time where the opponent, player B, is delayed in their response to the second stimulus. Why? because they're still reacting with reaction one. And that's the PRP. So let me take you back to why it's useful. 
It's, it's useful because it explains why throwing a dummy works. It's useful because it encourages athletes to use fake information in their process. You know, uh, go back to my badminton player in the mid-court. They, they look as if they're going to jump and smash and kill a sh- shuttle, and they just drop in a, a, a drop shot cross-court to win the point close to the net. Okay? Classic examples. It produces a delayed response in the opponent, and it operates on what we call the single-channel hypothesis, which says to us that a reaction has to be completed to stimulus one before the uh, performer can start to react for reaction two to stimulus two. And that's what we mean by the PRP. So it's a really nice theory. Um, I encourage you to be able to describe it in the way that I've just described it. I encourage you even to be able to draw it if you have to. And I remind you that this is a feature of time. This here is a period of elapsed time, some quarter of a second or something. Okay, it's a period of milliseconds, it's elapsed time where the performer has got the wrong response to the stimulus which is no longer relevant. Okay, I need to change the canvas because my um, my question format is on another canvas, I should be straight back with that. Now we're a little bit short of time, I've just been given the proper old hurry up here. So I'm going to do something slightly different with this particular question. What I'm going to do here is I'm going to plan it for you and I want you to complete the answer, okay? So let's let's do two things. Let's, with each of our answers, let's address the idea of, let me get rid of that actually, let us address the idea of the skill or the command word, okay? And let's then look at what the content would be within our answer, okay? And I'll get you guys to actually submit your answer. So I'd be really grateful if you could actually write on your sheet, take a photo and whack it on Twitter for us, for example. We'd actually like to see these, okay? So actually get these into us. So look, let's have a look at this as an example, first of all. Explain how. When we're asked to explain how something happens, we're being asked to go through a process. So classic example, or classic examples of uh, terminology we'll, we will use within our sentences when we are explaining how. We're going to say it happens through and it happens by the following. And we also tend to use things like because, although we tend to use those more for explain why. And we often use therefore, comma. And this means, this means, that's it. <laughs> what have I done there? This means type language. Okay, so this is the kind of connective language that you guys are going to be using. What we're looking to explain how about is how could Tom, he's our tennis player, of course, how could Tom benefit from a knowledge of the PRP in his tennis performances? So look, in terms of content for me, we are talking about dummies. We are talking about fakes. We are talking about delayed response delayed response and we are talking about the single the single channel hypothesis okay so could you guys get that content there's four key points there and of course you're going to describe the prp as it happens as well you know stimulus one reaction one stimulus two reaction two etc can you get this language into your answers in this structure you know it happens through it happens by it happens because, therefore, this means. Can you get that into your answer? And could you show me a five marker? Okay, for that. I'd be really interested to say to see what you what you provide for me there. Secondly, and we've got a six mark question here. We've got to look closely at this image. Thank you, I will. Analyze. Let me remind you what analyze means. It means to break down and explain something. Okay, now we're going to analyze the graph, making reference to the range of sporting performances. Okay, so obviously we're going to break it down to three parts. One, two, three. That's how we're going to break this down and explain each part. So classic language, we're going to have things like, firstly, notice the comma. We're going to use things like, secondly. We're going to use something like, lastly, or thirdly, or ultimately, or whatever. You're going to break this down. So firstly, this greeny bit. Secondly, this ready pinky bit. Thirdly, lastly, this yellowy bit. And you're going to explain then what you're seeing. And when you're explaining something, what do we already use? We use through, by, because, therefore, this means this is the kind of language we're going to, we're going to have like this. So, you know, analyzing this first part, why does it increase rapidly here? 
Why does the, uh, as number of choices goes up slightly, you get a dramatic increase in uh, time? And in fact, there's an error on this graph. This should be milliseconds. Okay, this should be milliseconds there, not seconds. Um, <clears throat> so why does it increase dramatically? Why does it start to level off in the second part? And why is it plateaued in the last part? Okay, can we use the language we just used, we just had within our discussion of Hick's law to, to go about this? So a couple of things that I would encourage you to include as part of your answer. Of course, you're going to mention Hick. I mean, it's in the questions. So you're probably not going to get any marks for that. You're going to mention bottleneck. You're going to mention... Uh, you're going to mention simple and choice reaction. You're going to mention um, uh, you're going to mention uh, overload, or what we might call sat saturation. You're going to mention RT equals well, let's call it RT two times movement time. Okay, so response time equals reaction time. Um, plus, sorry, not times, uh, movement time. So you're going to talk about uh, this concept here. You're going to talk about the plateau. You're going to talk about possible alternatives and so on. And this answer is going to get you a nice structure. But what you're going to do is you're going to break it down into parts firstly, secondly, and lastly. Okay. Or you, you may break it down to four if for some reason you might want to look at the axes or something I suppose but we really we, we've been given these three shadings so we're going to use those three sh shadings can you use this content to describe or sorry to analyze I should say break down and explain remembering that when you explain things you should be using this language up here I'm super interested to see what responses you guys can submit to us now what I'll do is I'll put an answer in place because we don't have time in this session today and I'll, I'll include this at the start of our next session on leadership so you've got my model answer basically uh, or maybe it'll be one of yours that one of you guys has submitted we'll go from there but I would like to see what you guys put in there but if you see maybe what's useful here is you see what process I would go through to answer these right I look at the command and I look at the knowledge which is required and I move forward on that basis can you guys do the same thing okay I'm going to leave that there because we're super short of time um So, yeah, we're back. We are. Yep. Tell me. Right. Um, well, you were just now just talking about the um, psychological refractory period <laughs> and the throwing a dummy thing. What are you, what are you laughing at? Nothing. Did I not say it properly? Um, am I right in thinking that when you talk about reaction one and reaction two, it's not n necessarily the whole reaction? So if you if you were going to do a tackle you wouldn't necessarily it wouldn't necessarily mean that you're going to go and follow through and do the whole tackle yeah that's right right so for example in that specific example we had there it would probably be just simply something like just the weight transfer you know the the player what was it which way around did I have it so the player the defensive player would almost just sort of step onto their left foot and then be committed to have their weight on their left foot so by the time they push back time has been lost and they would struggle to make the tackle on the other side so it, it could be as simple as that there are examples however where the first movement initiates an entire series of movements like a <clears throat> if you fall start in swimming or athletics you generally perform the entire movement because the first movement is it, it stimulates the entire thing um or an, another good one uh, to think about for the entire movement imagine if you're in a, a basketball scenario and someone sort of fake shots or fake shoots and the opponent uh, actually takes off the ground to block the ball of course once their feet are off the ground they can't readjust their start of reaction to until their feet are back on the ground because they've got nothing they've got no mechanics to push you know they've got nothing to push off so those would be more extreme examples but in this case i mean i would suggest that you know the the attacking player is simply looking for the defender to transfer their weight to one side so that they can go the other way and a really astute offensive player is going to be able to actually identify the moment at which the opponent does change weight and then they're going to go the other way. So it's that kind of level of sensitivity. We tend to look at this in a more macro sense, reaction one, reaction two, complete reaction one before complete, before starting reaction two. But it's probably much more nuanced and detailed than that. And, and am I right in thinking that this is more relevant in, in, in sports that are effectively games rather than... 
anything else yeah any any open or complex skill so wherever there's a high perceptual load within a performance what we'd call a complex skill or whenever there is a changeable environment which requires the adjustment of a skillful performance such as an open skill games are classic examples then that would be the case um you know for example t take the sport of tennis for a second there's every reason um for uh to, to to do a uh to, to perform a fake or a dummy uh when you're in an open rally because you can force your opponent into the wrong position but there's not much point doing a fake on the serve because well actually there are some exceptions to that it, it's a closed skill so <clears throat> it becomes less relevant i mean you can angle your racket as if you're going in one direction switch it but it's, it's kind of a little bit too explosive that probably wasn't the best example but yeah in more closed skills the, the need for something like a fake or a dummy is far, far less significant. Of course, it's particularly relevant when you've got an opponent, a, a direct opponent, that you can perform that fake against. And you, you see it all the time, a fake pass, a fake shot. Um, those kind of things would be classic examples. Uh, there are some sports, I'm trying to think of an example now, where faking is actually ruled out. You're not allowed to do it. Um, so in those in those examples you have to continue through your movement without um without stuttering or or, or or slowing down or changing direction so there are examples where it's actually regulated against mm -hmm. just can't think of any examples mm. right now no i wish you i wish you had because i'm, I'm I intrigued know. now i know <laughs> well there used to be one in taking penalties in football where you once you started your movement towards the ball you couldn't stop that may still well that may well still be a rule now but there's a lot of faking in that environment Mm -hmm. so you couldn't so, you couldn't pretend that you were going to kick it one way and kick it another well that's way. another case i mean because by pretending you're going to kick it like one way it could just be a matter of the way you angle your body or your eyes or your head but it was more that you can't you couldn't stutter the run-up so it was more of a rhythmical fake rather mm. than a directional one and so yeah it's probably a bad, a bad example to be fair i wasn't really planning it no, <laughs> it, no, it didn't, it didn't go well no, it makes sense yeah Good. any other questions um oh Mike is asking cricket bowling. He's suggesting if that could be well, cricket bowling. I would say where that one becomes interesting is um, something like a change of pace or a change of delivery action. Uh, so something like a spin bowler uh, delivering a top spin rather than a side spinning ball, or indeed vice versa. What you might find in that situation is they will prevent anticipation by the bats person because they'll cover the ball in their run-up they'll cover the ball so either the uh, batter person doesn't know which way the ball is going to swing or they don't know in the case of the spin bowler they don't know in which way the ball is rotating um, so it prevents them pre-loading uh, that spatial anticipation we mentioned earlier it prevents them fr from pre-loading a skill um, so that would be a good example in terms of the PRP I mean would I describe there being an outright fake in um in cricket ball the only thing i can think about is the, like the slower ball or the arm ball if you're a slower bowler uh where the bowler will release the ball in a really kind of fast action but they'll release it rather than your fingers being behind the ball like that where the full impact of the ball is positioned they'll either hold the ball like that or they'll even hold the ball like that so less force is applied to the ball so exactly the same action delivers a different outcome and that would be an example. So the, um, the 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 bats person will then play through the shot in the seek in the in the rhythm and timing of the ball moving at a different speed. Mm -hmm. So in other words, again, the, the the bats person is 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 actually using a form of spatial anticipation there, because they're they're oh, sorry that would be temporal anticipation that they're anticipating a particular outcome. Mm -hmm. So yeah, Brilliant. yeah, good question. Yeah. I hadn't thought about that one before. <laughs> Thank you, Mike. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> right. Yeah. Okay. That's that's it, really. Cool. For today. Good. So reminders to everyone: we are back on Wednesday. We only have two shows this week. We are back for leadership on Wednesday at four o'clock. So be with us for that. We've got a lot of content in that one, and then we've got a bit of a quiet time, and because of course it's reading week or half term the week after. We only have a show on the Thursday of that week. And then we're back for uh, a bit of biomechanics the following week. So uh, so look out for those. I do subscribe to the YouTube channel. Get involved with the Evelina.com. As we've said numerous times before, you we put in these adverts and things. They are comp they are entirely free trials available to people. It kind of surprises us that sometimes that not everybody would use that. It's a bit 
I don't get that. Um, it's free and you should use it. It's going to help you a lot in your revision. Um, so yeah, so that's that. Good. Brilliant. Have a good evening, everyone. Take Bye. care. The traditional classroom environment doesn't suit everyone. Students that don't fit this pace of learning begin to lose confidence. The problem is, the current learning model has holes in it. Luckily, the everlearner.com is here to fill those holes. With the Everlearner Classroom, each student is given a chance to master each subject at their own pace. With thousands of video tutorials and tens of thousands of automated questions on the site, students can progress at their own individual pace. And because every interaction is tracked within the site, teachers can review students' progress and gain access to razor-sharp data. Teachers will have more time to engage with small groups and be better informed of where their time and support is needed. With the Everlearner, teachers can leave the traditional model behind and become facilitators, coaches and inspirers. There's a reason we have over 100,000 registered students. To learn more, visit our website today. Thank you.